and um, I'm going to be like a moderator today. So thank you, first of all, for taking time to speak with us today. Um, could I ask, like, do you have a presentation for us or any information to share first? Yeah, I do have a presentation. Um, so I think I just need like screen sharing to share it. Uh, yeah, I, I, it says present now, I believe, to the bottom right of your screen. And okay. you could present your screen. There we go. Hmm. I guess I could do an entire screen. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, great. Um, wow. Okay, so I can see my presentation, but I can't see you. So I guess I'll just start. Is that okay? Yeah, that's good. Should I go ahead? Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, thanks for having me. My name is Stephanie, and I am a lawyer um, in New York City. That's uh, where I practice. Um, and I, my area of practice is zoning and land use. So it's sort of like a subset of real estate law. And um, I was connected um, to your high school by Toby Moskovitz, who um, is a client of mine and, and my firm's in the past. Um, so I've done this, uh, I've come and, and spoken to, um, to your class, uh, to Mr. Codio's class for a few years in a row. Um, and usually it's just about the basics of zoning. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Although if you have questions or want to talk about anything in particular, I'm super happy to do that. Um, so so I think um, this presentation is sort of going to start out talking about the history of zoning, like how it came to be in New York City. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about um, sort of the fundamentals of what zoning controls. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's what we're going to go through. So um, this is a photograph by Jacob Rees, um, and, and this really is intended to um, depict sort of the conditions, um, of the late 1800s that, um, zoning, um, was sort of an answer to, um, so, or, and, and, and provisions in the building code as well. We're not talking about the building code. We're, we're really more talking about zoning, but, um, you know, the zoning resolution is really, um, it's a, it's a law that's intended to regulate use and bulk of development in New York city. So when a new building goes up, there's a law that says, what kind of uses you can have in the building and um, what the size and shape of the building have to be. And, um, you know, this is really sort of the story of how this law came to be. Um, so Jacob Reese was a photographer in the late 1890s who documented, you know, a lot of overcrowding conditions, people um, really being immigrants, um, moving to New York City and um, really not having a lot of space. Um, the The... The, the first zoning resolution was um, really focused on getting light and air into buildings. Um, light and air was sort of seen as a disinfectant that could, um, you know, sterilize microbes and bacteria. Um, the, the trigger for the very first zoning resolution that was enacted in 1916 is this building. It's called the Equitable Building, and it's on Broadway in the Financial District in Manhattan. It's still there. Um, but it basically um, occupied an entire city block um, without any setbacks. It just rose straight up for 42 stories, and um, it cast a seven-acre shadow. And, you know, this, you know, of this concern about light and air not reaching the street, um, you know, pe people were starting to get concerned that with the invention of steel, which allowed um, taller and taller buildings to be constructed, um, that, you know, all of Manhattan was going to be overcome with these, you know, giant buildings that didn't provide any setbacks and um, were going to eliminate light and air to the street and, and create, like, really unpleasant conditions. So um, the first zoning resolution was enacted in 1916, and it required sort of this staggered setback, sort of like a wedding cake. Um, and, and the idea was that, you know, the sun would shine down and more, more light and air would hit the street. <laughs> Um, the zoning resolution, um, however, in 1961, 
um, was completely rewritten. And that's the zoning resolution that we still work with today. We call it the 1961 zoning resolution. And um, the, uh, the, the goal of the zoning resolution in 1961, they were very focused on this tower in the park design. Um, so the, the rules were created to sort of um, allow a, a, a sort of more tower in the park design where, where the, there would be open space um, at ground level, the building would be set back from the street and um, the building would sort of be skinnier and taller and, and they were very focused on having open and green space um, uh, at, at street level. Um, this was a sort of design that was um, sort of uh, made popular by an architect named Le Corbusier. He had this sort of vision of a city of towers um, that was placed amid gardens and playgrounds and um, allowed, you know, lots of light and air to the apartments above. Um, and, you know, uh, <laughs> allowed a lot of light and air, but then people were sort of also very removed from the street level because they were in towers. Um, so, um, in response to this sort of idea of tower in the park, there was a civic activist in the sixties named Jane Jacobs, who advocated, um, for sort of a more, more focus on like street life and more focus on, um, sort of the interaction between people inside buildings and people on the street and on the sidewalk, um, you know, sort of, uh, thought that the use of the sidewalk was really important and wanted to bring activity down sort of to the street level. Um, and, and a lot of the, the, the zoning resolution that we use today, um, I think was a, a bit of a response to this idea that, you know, we don't necessarily want all of New York city to be giant towers surrounded by open space, but, you know, we want sort of shorter squatter buildings, um, you know, maybe like a brownstone style that like has sort of more interaction between, you know, people on a stoop, people on the street. Um, so, um, this, this woman, Jane Jacobs wrote a book called the death and life of great American cities um, which really advocated for communities to have a say in um, what is built in their in their community and um, for this sort of more human scale type building rather than the giant towers. Um, so uh, Jane Jacobs was also an opponent of um, this guy Robert Moses, who um, had a plan. Um, he was he was really one of the most um, powerful uh, figures in New York City um, planning history. I mean, he really was influential. He, he managed to, um, uh, he, he sort of got the Cross Bronx Expressway built, the Sheridan Expressway, the Belt Parkway, the Triborough Bridge. I think this is the Cross Bronx, the Triborough, the Verrazano. These are all um, sort of Robert Moses um, projects. And, um, you know, he had a plan to actually build another expressway through Washington Square Park in the West Village um, that Jane Jacobs was a vocal opponent of, and they managed to get that stopped. But um, there was very, very nearly another expressway running right through um, the bottom of Manhattan through the West Village in Washington Square. So, um, and Robert Moses was really um, more focused on cars than public transportation. He, he felt like the car was the superior form of transportation. Um, so you know, that's why he focused on um, bridges and highways. Um, so, but, but just generally the challenge of New York City zoning, um, you know, it, it's sort of um, a law that, that is intended to shape the types of development we see in New York City, but it also has to be responsive to the challenges that New York City faces. Um, we know that um, the population of New York City um, is, is, on the, is on the rise. I mean, COVID maybe has changed that a little bit, but like the general idea is that we, we know that um, from 2010 to 2040, the population of New York City is gonna increase by a million people. Um, so it's hard to say how COVID will affect that, but up, in, up, up to now, um, that has been one of the, the big challenges of the city is finding um, enough housing 
to to hold everyone and to hold everyone affordably. Um, there are also, you know, some some sort of more tangential land use issues, such as, you know, how do we make sure small businesses are protected um, and that chain stores don't completely drive them out? Um, how do we make sure that there are grocery stores with fresh food in every neighborhood? Um, how do we keep um, manufacturing jobs in the city? Um, you know, we have, uh, there are some districts that are manufacturing districts wh- where, you know, in the past, there were lots of jobs. Like in the Navy Yard, people would build ships, um, you know, and and more and more those jobs have, over the years, those jobs have disappeared. So um, keeping uh, certain zoning districts that allow um, for, for good paying manufacturing jobs is something that politicians talk about a lot. Um, and the whole idea of whether buildings are too tall, whether the zoning is allowing buildings to be built that are too tall, that are out of context with what's around it. Um, these are all sort of the, the balancing. And then, of course, building housing, you know, making sure that we do have enough housing for everyone to live in. These are the sort of balancing factors that um, politicians, the city council and the city planning commission all have to balance. So um, the zoning resolution basically splits the whole city up into three kinds of districts, um, residential districts, commercial districts and manufacturing districts. Um, so residential districts, and this is, you know, like a tiny house squished between apartment buildings, um, residential districts allow residential uses, you know, put homes, places where people can live, whether it's a single family home or an apartment building. And they also allow, um, uses called community facility uses, which are things that benefit the community that aren't like stores, things like doctor's offices, um, churches, temples, houses of worship generally, um, schools are a community facility use, um, daycares, um, I said medical offices, and there's some, you know, uses like clubs and things like that, that don't have very many actual, um, instances of them being around, but, um, so that's, that. In residential districts, you're allowed to have residential uses and community facility uses. Sometimes you might see, if you go out with a zoning map and walk around the city and compare what's built to what the zoning map is, you might see a commercial use, like a store in a residence district. And um, those cases are usually because they existed before the zoning resolution was created in 1961, or maybe it got a special approval. But generally... Um, the uses that you'll see will match what the zoning district allows. Um, commercial districts obviously allow stores, um, you know, and within, within each of these three broad categories, residential, commercial, and, commu- and manufacturing, there are then like sub-districts that, um, you know, s- that, that have more specific regulations about how big your store can be or how big your, your, uh, residential use can be, whether it's a single family home, whether you can have apartment buildings. So these are just like the three general categories. Um, commercial districts allow stores, um, of all kinds, big store, some districts allow bigger stores, some districts allow smaller stores. And then for some reason, the zoning resolution goes into like, um, it sort of breaks down the type of store into a lot of different uses that are completely irrelevant today. Like for instance, um, there's a category for typewriter repair in the zoning resolution. And, you know, we're not using a lot of type. Maybe they were in the 60s, but we're not using a lot of typewriters today. And certainly if we are, we don't have a whole store to repair them. Um, there are also like stores for, um, you know, like like fur shops and um, I don't know, like just all sorts of uses that at, in, at this point are completely irrelevant. So, um So that's sort of a challenge in working with the zoning resolution, which is, um, you know, you sort of have to um, adapt, uh, sort of adapt the reality of today's, um, today's stores and today's uses and sort of fit them into categories that, that for the most part are a little obsolete. Um, But, you know, this is just an image of Koreatown, I think in Manhattan, but maybe Flushing, it's hard to say. Um, 
And this is showing commercial uses on multiple floors, which um, you can't do in every commercial district. So um, this is a pretty high density commercial district. Um, and then manufacturing, um, you know, uh, over the years, manufacturing districts have been rezoned, um, to residential districts, um, just to facilitate, you know, more housing so we can build more. Um, but you know, to a certain extent, we obviously need manufacturing districts for essential, um, you know, essential things that need to happen in the city. Like these are the digester eggs in Greenpoint. Um, they take sewage literally, um, the stuff from your toilet and put it into these giant eggs and sort of like cook it down into like a, a solid product that is then like shipped down to like somewhere in the South. Um, but you know, this is something obviously we need, so we can't rezone every manufacturing district in the city. Um, and manufacturing districts also, you know, have things like, you know, sanitation garages, power plants, you know, all the uses that you don't sort of want to be near, um, but that need to exist in order for a city to function properly. So, um, so generally, um, this is, uh, an image of sort of the lowest density residential district, um, and the, and the envelope, the zoning envelope that that district, um, would allow, um, you can see that it's, it's an R1, and um, in an R1, you have to have single-family homes. They have to be set back from the street. They have to be, they have to have a side yard. They have to have a, a yard in the back as well. And you're sort of given this zoning envelope, this, this envelope. We call it an envelope. It's like a, it's like a theoretical, um, it's a, a theoretical envelope that you're allowed to build within. Um, outlined in dotted blue um, that the law basically creates for you and says, as long as you don't exceed this envelope, you're fine. So this is the lowest density R district. Um, and it sort of gives you a little bit of a cap on height, but sort of gives you a slope that you can work within. So it's not too restrictive and it gives you a bit of flexibility in, um, in designing a building. Um, then we get to the R2 where you see like, um, maybe the houses are a little taller um, and uh, and maybe have uh, driveways next to them. R threes, if you start seeing duplexes um, where there's two units in one single building, or maybe two buildings that are attached. Um, and then we start getting into R five where you have townhouses that are actually touching. Um, and, uh, you know, the lower density districts require you to have the side yards. So the houses have to be separate, but then as you start going up in the density, um, you know, you're allowed to have buildings that touch each other and, um, you know, there's still a backyard. There's still a required requirement for a backyard. There's, in this case, it looks like there's a requirement for a front yard or maybe at least a little bit of a setback. Um, and the buildings are still relatively low rise, like three stories, um, and then we start getting into, this is actually an R6. Um, the buildings start getting significantly bigger. Um, they're apartment buildings. Um, but you can see that, um, there are two types of buildings here. One is quality housing and one is height factor. The height factor is more like the tower in the park with the Corbusier style where the building's set back from the street and you have open area at grade quality housing buildings are built right to the street line and are a little shorter and squatter. Um, they might have the same amount of floor area in them, but the shape is different. Um, in some districts in the city, quality housing is mandatory. Um, and in some districts that uh, maybe are a little older, of the dis a little older, um, you can have either a height factor or a quality housing building. And then mandatory inclusionary housing, or MIH, which is shown here, um, we'll talk about that later, but that's a recent law that says whenever you get a rezoning, um, you have to have a certain percentage of your uh, housing be affordable um, for a new building that you're building. So um, they give you a little bit of an extra floor area increase um, in exchange for that requirement of affordable housing. It's either 25 or 30 percent affordable of your floor area has to be affordable. So um, now we're seeing how the buildings sort of get bigger in an R7, in an R8, R9, and R10, which is 
generally about as big as a residential building gets in New York City. Um, and uh, we also see, um, you know, there you can sort of pair a commercial district with a residential district where you have um, a seat overlay, which means you can have a residential building with commercial on the ground floor and then residential above it. And then, you know, sort of as the commercial districts get denser and denser, you have um, larger and larger commercial buildings. Um, C6 and C8 is sort of like a specialized um, type of district that allows only certain kinds of commercial uses. And then your manufacturing district, which sort of anticipates a sort of squat sort of factory style building with a lot with large floor plates. So you can, you know, manufacture a lot of things or do whatever you need to do. Okay. So, um, could I just check in and make sure everyone can hear me? Yeah, we, can. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> I was worried that I was just talking and no one was even there. Okay, great. Um, so let's just keep going. So, um, this is, this, this is what we're going to start talking about floor area and floor area ratio. Um, this is the most important um, regulation in the zoning resolution. It's the number one thing that people want to know when they have a piece of land. They want to know how much floor area can we build on it because that is really going to determine the size of your building. It doesn't necessarily determine the shape of your building because there are other rules that you know tell you um, how your building can be shaped on your on your land, um, and it can sort of limit how much floor area. That, that you can use, but ultimately floor area is the most important regulation. So, um, you know, every district allows a different FAR. It's an FAR is a floor area ratio and it tells you how much floor area you can build on your zoning lot. So, um, you know, your zoning lot has a certain amount of lot area. You know, you might have a zoning lot that's like, you know, let's say like 10,000 square feet in an area, you literally have like ground, a ground that's measured 10,000 square feet. Um, an FAR of one would allow you to build 10,000 square feet of building essentially, or floor area is what, what we call it. Um, so the example at the top sort of shows conceptually how, um, how you can look at that amount of floor area. Either you can take, um, your 10,000 square feet of building and put it right down on top of your 10,000 square feet of land. And you've got, you know, a hundred percent of your lot is covered by building. Um, but you don't have to necessarily design it that way. You could stack your floor area on top of each other and cover only 50% of your lot area with the same amount of floor area. You still have the 10,000 square feet of floor area. It's just now you've got like 5,000 on the first floor and 5,000 on the second floor you know, it's a different building shape, but, um, it's the same amount of floor area. And so, you know, again, you can sort of stack it, you know, so that a quarter of your lot is covered with the same amount of floor area going up for four stories. So, um, you know, sort of looking at an FAR of four, if you've got a 10,000 square foot lot, that means you can build 10,000 times four, which is 40,000 square feet you know, the same idea applies. You can sort of move that amount of floor area around, um, you know, around on your zoning lot by stacking it on top of each other um, while maintaining the same amount of floor area. And that, you know, an FAR of nine would mean that on a 10,000 square foot lot, you could build 90,000 square feet of floor area and sort of, array, you know, sort of stack it in various ways, depending on what the rules are in your district, um, for the shape of your building. So, um, yeah, this is just sort of explaining the same thing. Um, a 10,000 square foot building covering hundred percent of the lot, um, at an FAR of one is, you know, a 10,000 square foot building on a 10,000 square foot lot, but you can sort of, um, shift it around depending on what the rules are for how you shape your building. Um, and the rules for how you shape your building include maybe a height limit on how tall of a building you can have. Like we saw in some of the earlier slides, you might be required to have a rear yard 
which means your building has to have like a 30 foot area in the back or your lot has to have a 30 foot area in the back where there is no building. Um, uh, you might need a, a setback in the front. Um, and you might need, if you have multiple buildings on your zoning lot, you might need space between them. But um, those are sort of more technical zoning issues. So um, here we sort of show a height factor building that has, you know, open space at the base, set back from the street line. Um, this is how a height factor building um, is limited in its height. Um, the city has sort of like a complicated formula for um, allowing a sort of imaginary plane that you can't penetrate. So your building for, for a height factor building, um, you know, has a front wall. Um, and then above that, you know, and the front wall has a maximum height. And then above that, your building has to set back and it can't penetrate this, what's called a sky exposure plane, which depending on the district allows you a certain amount of vertical distance to a certain amount of horizontal distance and creates this sort of like imaginary line that, that sort of shoots back from the street line. And so as long as your building is behind it, you're fine. Um, and eventually, you know, you sort of top out when the, the sky exposure plane runs out of zoning lot to cover. Um, but this is like a height factor regulation. Um, the quality housing regulations, on the other hand, um, sort of encourage a building that is right at the street, that is connected to the other buildings, and it gives you a very discrete height limit. It isn't this, you know, sort of like complicated formula. They tell you, you can only build 100 feet tall, and that's it. And then maybe on top of the 100 feet, you could have a bulkhead, which we're not going to count against you, but, you know, your bulkhead can only be a certain size. Um, so that's how, and, and, um, more and more in, um, in the two thousands under, um, the chair of the city planning commission, Amanda Burden, um, a lot of, uh, a fair amount of the city was rezoned to a contextual district that actually requires this kind of, um, this kind of development and doesn't allow a, a height factor building. So, um, you can sort of see the difference in these photos between the height factor buildings and the quality housing building. The two on the left are height factor, um, sort of taller. Um, the, the one on the right is a quality housing building that um, is a little shorter and sort of more blends in with what's around it, is the idea at least. Um, so we can sort of go through an example of, um, of how you apply zoning regulations if you wanted to build on the site and sort of the, the steps that you would go through to figure out what you can build and how, how to apply the zoning regu regulations. So this is um, a site, it's 10,000 square feet in an R6A district. Um, we have a... Uh, uh, we have a lot that's called an interior lot because um, it's, you know, it's got some frontage on a wide street, but the rest of it is surrounded by other tax lots. Um, and it's a wide street, so it's 75 feet or more in width. And that also affects how we apply the, the regulations because some of them, um, some of the regulations are different depending on whether the street is wide or it's narrow. So, for an R6A, you get a um, an FAR of three, which means you can build up to 30,000 square feet of floor area. So, you know, this is a, the first step is you sort of model out or mass out 30,000 square feet, which is, you know, three stories that takes up the whole, the whole amount of your lot area. Um, but then you have to start applying the rules that actually mold the shape of your building. So the first one is... Um, lot coverage. You're actually only allowed to cover 65% of your lot when you're looking down at the building from like from the sky. If you were looking at it straight down, um, how much of your lot is covered by building? And it can only be up to 65%. So right away we have to sort of 
shrink our building, but stack that floor area on top of what's, uh, what's there, um, to comply with that 65% max lot coverage. Um, then we, um, we have to have a 30 foot rear yard. This is for any residential building. You need to have a 30 foot rear yard. Um, it's just a requirement. Um, there's also a requirement in the multiple dwelling law that your all windows that uh, lead to living rooms have to look out either onto a street or onto a required rear yard um, or onto a complying court. Um, and that's just to make sure that everyone's getting light and air into their bedrooms, into their living rooms. Um, but this is just um, sort of one piece of that requirement, which is you've always got to have a 30 foot rear yard for a residential building. So so we add that in there and then we stack the floor area on top of our building. And then um, you can sort of see in the front between these two slides how the building gets pulled back a little bit to meet the, um, the street wall of the building next to it. So that's a quality housing idea is that you sort of want a consistent line of buildings going down the street. Um, so, yeah, we provide a 10-foot setback just like all the buildings around us. Um, so that sort of further squeezes us into a particular shape. Um, and I think at this point we're at 60% lot coverage because of these, the required rear yard and because of the required setback. Um, and then, right, so we, we have a, a height limit that is sort of like a two-prong height limit. The first thing is that, you know, the front wall of your building can only go up to 60 feet and then you have to set back and then you might be able to go up a little higher after you set back, but the front wall can only be 60 feet higher or 60 feet tall. Um, so that is shown here, that 60 foot front wall height limit. And then we also see that, you know, we're not required to have a side yard. But um, if you have any open space on the side of your building, you do have to have at least eight feet. You can't just have like a two foot gap between your building and another building. It has to be like a reasonable amount of space. So it looks like we're providing a, an eight foot side yard. <clears throat> um, and it looks like we're now at 50% lot coverage um, because of that side yard requirement. So Right. Like I said, we, we see that the building goes up, the front wall goes to 60 feet um, in height, and then we have a setback uh, of 10 feet that we have, to, we have to provide. And then above that, we can actually bring the, the building, the, the, the total height of the building can go up to 70 feet. So this is sort of the box that they squeeze you into um, to... <laughs> You know, you can't just, at least in New York City, in many of the districts, you can't just build whatever you want. You have to sort of meet this uh, sort of envelope requirement. And in, especially in the contextual districts, they sort of squeeze you into the shape that they want, that they find, you know, to be pleasing um, or, or whatever. So, you know, and, it, and it's a way of controlling height while still giving you um, the ability to build a, you know, substantial amount of area. But, um, you know, what happens a lot of the time with the developers is obviously developers want to maximize the amount of floor area they can build because that, that's where the value is, you know, that the size of your building is, is its value. Um, so they're going to take the envelope that the city gives you and really just try and fill it out. You know, they're not going to get creative within the envelope because then they might not be maximizing the amount of floor area that they're building. So in a district, um, the buildings tend to look exactly like the envelopes that they're given because that's how you maximize your floor area. So, um, and then you can see the little white thing on top is like a bulkhead, you know, when you have like a stairway or an elevator that goes all the way up through the building um, for elevators, you need like mechanical equipment. And then for stairways, um, you might need like, um, an exit to the roof. So you have a little box on top that exceeds your 70 foot maximum building height, but, um, that's okay. They allow you to have like, you know, things on top of the building that exceed your building height. They're called permitted obstructions. 
um, and they don't count them against you, but they, you know, you're not allowed to have a giant bulkhead. It's just reasonably sized. You might be allowed to have a parapet wall on top of your building. You might be allowed to have a solar panel on top of your building that doesn't count against your maximum building height, um, like a water tank or something like that. So, um, you can sort of see, um, in the calculations on this page, um, you know, that we have, you know, uh, we, we still have our three FAR that allows us 30,000 square feet, um, that we're maximizing here. I think it looks like we're going beyond that for some reason. We've got three stories of floor area at 2,966 square feet of coverage. We've got four stories at, yeah, 5,500 square feet of coverage. So the top three stories are a little smaller than the bottom three, four stories. It adds up to um, 30,000 square feet of floor area. Oh, and um, mechanical space does not count as floor area. So that includes um, machine rooms, um, I'm not really even sure what else counts as mechanical space, maybe like elevator machinery, um, things like that don't count as floor area. So maybe you have 900 square feet of mechanical space that brings your gross square footage to 30,900 square feet, but your zoning is still at 30,000 square feet because you don't count mechanical space as floor area under the zoning resolution. <coughs> so that's, um, basically the shape of your building. And then what goes on inside, you actually have a limit on the amount of apartments or dwelling units that you can provide in your building. Um, you know, uh, each district is given a dwelling unit factor and you take your total permitted residential floor area, you divide it by, fa by that dwelling unit factor, and then you get the total number of dwelling units you're allowed to provide. So in this example, um, our dwelling unit factor is 680, which is the actual dwelling unit factor for an R6A. So for a 30,000 square foot um, building, you divide it by 680 and you get 44 dwelling units. So you're, that's the maximum you're allowed. Um, you also have a parking requirement that is unfortunately in many districts, if you build an apartment building, no matter how close you are to the subway, you still have to provide parking. Um, and that's a real problem for uh, our clients for developers who are building because you're sort of creating this space that isn't really generating any money. You can't sell it. You can't rent. I mean, you can rent a parking space. It's just a lot, it's a lot less valuable than, than an apartment. Um, and a lot of times, you know, these parking spaces are built and they aren't really fully used, you know, especially if, um, the, the apartment building is near a lot of, subway stops if it's near transit um parking just isn't fully utilized so that's something that um the city planning commission is always thinking about changing is getting rid of the parking requirement for new development but it's very difficult to do that because there are areas in the city that need parking and um it's kind of a politically very contentious subject um so let's see Right, this goes into the parking. For an R6A, you actually need parking for 70% of your apartments. So um, if you've got 44 apartments and you need parking, one parking space for 70% of each of those apartments, that means you need 31 spaces. Um, so you could provide it, I guess, behind the building, but then you don't have a nice rear yard. You could put it underground, but... Um, that's very expensive to dig your parking garage um, and put all of your parking underground. It really increased the cost, increases the cost of your development and then forces the developer to charge more for the apartment, the apartments themselves, because you've spent all this money digging out your parking garage. Or you could put it within the building, but then it potentially takes away from your floor area. So then you've got, you know, uh, like 5,000 square feet of your building is dedicated to parking instead of to apartments. So um, that's sort of the, the conundrum of providing parking. Um, then there's also a little uh, planting requirement. You've got to plant the area between the front of your building and the street. That's in the zoning resolution. And then you got to provide street trees. This is uh, anytime you build a building new, um, you do have to provide street trees. I think there is a way to get around this. 
if um if you're physically unable to put the tree um in a place where it's not gonna you know be too close to like mailboxes and street poles sometimes there's so much stuff in the on the sidewalk already um that the department of transportation doesn't actually want you to put a tree in front of the house or in front of the building in which case you can actually um donate to a fund um for street trees elsewhere in the city rather than um clutter up the sidewalk too much but in most cases you have to build your trees um and then this sort of illustrates this concept of mandatory inclusionary housing which was something we um, we very briefly touched on um you know this is a new law that was enacted in 2016 um actually this is the voluntary inclusionary housing program because it's only 20 percent of floor area there are areas in the city where um, they wanted to encourage people to build affordable housing. And affordable housing is housing, that, housing that's actually regulated in a certain way. You know, most ha- most housing, if it's market rate, someone builds it, they charge whatever they think um, is appropriate or what the market would pay for that housing. Um, affordable housing, the, the cost of your rent um, is, t- is sort of tagged to... Um, uh, a standard set by the federal government, basically. And the federal government says, you know, if you're a family of three and you're making X amount of money, um, your rent should be, you know, no more than 30% of what your your income is. So um, a- affordable housing in New York City means that you're regulated, that you're, you're subject to a requirement that you cannot charge more than a certain amount of money for your apartments, that someone's um, checking in on you that the government is, you know, you've signed an agreement and it's recorded at the city register's office where you, you know, you promise um, to always comply with the affordable housing law. Um, and basically you're, you're just very heavily regulated. So um, the city, I think in maybe the nineties created a program um, to encourage people to, to sort of build affordable housing and, and do it on a voluntary basis um, um and, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, I know you can see the screen, but um a couple students do have questions. So if you sure. want to go further. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I can't see any questions right now because I can only oh, that's see fine. I could uh, start reading some too. Oh uh, yeah. So okay. Justin I see them Hunter, now. He said, Would a community garden or a park be placed in a residential zone or is it a commercial zone? That's a good question. Um I think that it could be either. Um, I think that a community garden, um, there are like uses that are considered accessory to residential. Um, and I don't know if, if it would be accessory to residential. It might actually just be a, considered a community facility use. Um, like I said, in residential districts, you can have not just residences, but community facilities, which, you know, are beneficial things like, you know, um, medical offices, schools, um, and I, and I believe a community garden is considered a sort of open use that, you know, is beneficial to the community and, and would be allowed in the residence district. Yeah. It would also be allowed in a commercial district. Ryan Singh, he says, how can I gain more air rights to a building while also keeping the same shape? Um, I mean, you, yeah. To a certain extent, if you're if you're going to get more air rights, which is something that you can do um, through uh, a process where you buy someone's unused air rights, you know, there's either you're, you're given a certain amount of air rights. Air rights and floor area are sort of used interchangeably. Um, you know, you're given a, a certain amount of floor area or air rights from the city under the law. Um, there is this this method by which developers purchase unused air rights or floor area from a neighbor. Um, but you do need to change the shape of your building to use it. You would need to like make a bigger building and you would only buy, uh, those unused air rights. If the, the sort of rules on your building shape actually let you fit it in your building envelope. And sometimes they don't, but, um, in, in most, in the cases that I work on, obviously, um, the, the rules allow you to, to actually, um, even though you're not given that floor area from the city right off the bat, the rules do allow you to keep sort of building up. 
Um, so, yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, Yufeng, he says, what does the zoning regulation say about parts? And, or, well, Yufeng, would you like to read your question? Because I know it's an extensive question. Uh, yeah, sure. Right, uh, so I would like to ask, um, what does the zoning regulation say about parks? And what gets built into, like, parks or, like, public spaces? Yeah. Um, this is a good question, and it's not something I deal with a lot because parks are actually sort of outside of the zoning resolution. If you look at a zoning map, um, you'll see, you know, you've got your residence districts, your commercial, your manufacturing districts, but a park is on the zoning map, and it's just labeled park. And you can't build anything on a park. Um, it's under the jurisdiction of the Department of Parks and Recreation. It's owned by the city, generally. Um, so, so it's not a zoning issue, but there are rules. The Parks Department has rules on what you can do, you know, the city, what the city can actually build and do in a park. Sometimes they grant concessions where they may be able to have a kiosk and they'll say, okay, we can build a gazebo. Um, or we can, we can, you know, sort of lease license. It's not even a lease. It's a license. They can license a kiosk to someone who's selling like snacks and water. Um, but yeah, there, there are rules, but it's, if those rules are, um, the parks department rules and they're not a zoning issue. And, um, although I will say, if you want to get really complicated, I believe Brooklyn bridge park there was like a whole controversy because I think there was somehow permission granted for a building to be built in Brooklyn bridge park. And I don't really know the facts about it, but it might be an interesting thing to look into about how that was possible because generally it's impossible to build a building in a park. It's not public land. I mean, it's public land. It's not private land and you're, you're not allowed to give, you know, a park to a developer to build anything, but Brooklyn bridge park, something weird happened there. So you can, if you wanted to sort of find something interesting, you might be able to look into that. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'll look into it. Uh, also, yeah. um, does like everyone have like where can you like check these regulations since there's like a yeah. Lot of um, you definitely can, and that was something I actually wanted to um to show you. Can you see this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I actually have a link to the zoning resolution. This is not my like main work screen, um, but uh, <laughs> this is like even my private uh, internet browser. I have a link to the zoning resolution because I use it constantly. So um, it's online. Um, this is the, the, the address. It's pretty short. Um, but this is, yeah, this is actually really good. I should have done this before. <laughs> Like the whole thing is now digital and it's online. Um, so you can literally go through and read the whole thing cover to cover, although I would never recommend that. But I will say that when I am doing a zoning analysis on a building, um, which actually I was doing that this morning, I, I, we have been asked to write an opinion letter for a client, which means he's got a whole plan to build a building. He's trying to get a loan from a bank to build this building and the bank wants us to um, provide a letter saying that his plan to build this building is in full compliance with the zoning resolution. So that's a big thing to, to provide, right? Like um, we, we have to be completely sure that the plan that we've been given complies in every aspect with the zoning resolution. So really what you want to do, what we do when we're asked to do an analysis of a building is we go through every single regulation that would apply and we read or at least skim to make to see if it doesn't apply. If it doesn't apply, you, you know, pretty quickly, but you go through every single law and you, and you check and, and analyze the building and, and see that it complies. So you've got, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. It's a lot of work this is how you sort of do it. You've got floor area, density, lot area, yards, height and setback, minimum distance between buildings. <laughs> so, um, so that's sort of how you do it. But, um, like if you wanted to take, you know, a 
building on a particular random site in New York and figure out um, what zoning district it's in, you would um, you would have to first. Here we go, city planning. You would have to first um, find the zoning district that it's in. Um, and actually, this is a really good. Here, let's get out of here. Um, this is a really good tool. It's called Zola. Um, the, I don't know if there's like a really good easy link. I think just zola.planning.myc.gov. Have you guys used this before? Yeah. I've used this before. Okay. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So this, we use it constantly. It's definitely not a, uh, a substitute for um, checking the zoning maps themselves. But, um, you know, let's see. I'll take... Let's take like a random site in, I don't know, maybe not Manhattan. Maybe let's, let's do something in Williamsburg. Well, isn't your high school, let's see, is on North 6 between Havemeyer and Drake's, is that right? Where's Havemeyer? Here we go. Is this your high school? Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. Between Roebling and Havemeyer. So um, this is pretty cool because it gives you so much information right away. We can see that your school is owned by the New York City Department of Education. Um, you can see the lot area. Um, you can see an estimate of how much existing floor area is built, although it's very, very sketchy and you really can't, you really can't rely on any of this information. Like if you're giving your client, um, you know, an analysis or certainly not writing an opinion letter, you want to get a survey showing how big the lot actually is. You want to go to the zoning map, um, and look with your own eyes rather than, you know, sort of rely on the district, how they show the districts, um, on through Zola, but you can see that your school is in an R6B and an R6A. It's sort of split, but, um, let's see, you can also check that on the zoning map. You can actually sort of zoom in on the zoning map and verify that. So we're, it's up here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So right at the top corner, you can see um, where your school is, and it's split between an R6B, and then you can see this is R6A. So yeah, so those are really the, 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 the things that we use to practice and to actually implement these things in real life. We use Zola to find the zoning map, the tax map, and then, of course, um, this online zoning resolution is at this point the most up to date. They used to do a printed version that was the official version, but now the official version is actually this online version. So those are, you know, that's literally what we use to practice law. Yeah. And what architects use. Um, Maya Ortiz has a question. So Maya, if you could mm -hmm. please ask your question aloud, that would be great. Maya. Uh, I'll, I'll read the question. She says, mm -hmm. I'm working on a historic building landmark structure at Roosevelt Island. Is it possible to change the zoning for that type of building or does that stay the same? Yeah. So changing, is this, no, that's Governor's Island, isn't it? Roosevelt. Um, changing zoning is... It's something we do, and I'm actually working on two rezonings right now. Um, it's a process. It, um, it's, it's a political process. Um, it's possible to, to get a rezoning. Um, the city itself undertakes rezonings of areas in the city all the time. Um, I'm trying to think of a city-initiated city rezoning um, that really? recently happened. To be more specific, like we're working with um, smallpox. That's the building that she's talking about, and mm -hmm. noticed we, um, we noticed how it's R. I believe it's R seven, so mm -hmm. it's residential. So is there like so in regards to that question, like how could we 
are we able to change that zoning or do we have to keep it that similar when we're thinking about reconstruction and uh, like future uses of the building? Yeah. I mean, I think it depends on, you know, it, it depends on the sort of the outline, the parameters of the assignment. You know, it certainly is possible to change the zoning. It takes years and the city council person has to approve. So you could maybe have a hypothetical where you say, we are assuming that we're going to go get a rezoning and rezone it to a C district or something like that. Um, I don't know. It just depends on the assignment. But, um, you know, there are situations where, um, you know, if the city owns the land, um, they do something called a zoning override. Um, They generally don't override floor area, but they might override use. Um, if the state owns the land, they do something called a general project plan and the state isn't subject to city zoning. Um, but the, you know, in reality, you'd have to comply if you're, if you, if you're building, you have to comply with the R72 unless you go and get a rezoning, which is, um, a process called Euler. You may have heard of it. It takes years. It's very expensive. Um, you have to study the environmental impact of, what you're planning to change the zoning to. Um, but it's, it's theoretically possible. You just have to get, you know, the community board will vote and have a, a an opinion about what you're doing. The borough president will have a vote. The city planning commission has to be in agreement and the city council person has to ultimately say yes or no. So, you know, I, I'm not sure about the assignment, but, you know, theoretically it's possible. All right, thank you. Um, mm-hmm. Myra Gomez, she asked, um, Myra, could you unmute? Hi, yeah. Um, I have a question. What are some com- common mistakes made w- in the zoning aspect of a district or a building? Like mistakes that like an architect might make in designing a building? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a good question um, because it's true. Like, this stuff is so complicated that people do make mistakes. Um, I, and I, I could talk for a while about this. I mean, one, the most prominent mistake I remember is like somewhere in like the, in midtown Manhattan, someone had misread the zoning map so that it looked like the zoning district was boundary was one place rather than another. And they built a giant tower and it was only after the tower was constructed that, you know, someone figured out that they had misread the zoning map and they weren't actually allowed to have an additional 12 stories on a portion of their building and they had to remove it. And it's a case called Parkview Associates. Um, So um, that's one of the most, that's a common mistake is if, you know, the zoning map is sometimes not always clear. You know, you can sort of see it's like you've got arrows pointed to certain things. There aren't dimensions always. You know, they show like a, a block or a tax lot, but they don't give you dimensions. Um, you know, sometimes the dimensions are you're sort of assumed to know them because, you know, L, there's a section of the zoning resolution that talks about um location of district boundaries and it it says like if there's no dimension shown on your zoning map then you sort of have to assume that your district boundary is located you know depending on which district it is in a certain place so that's a little confusing and then sometimes you have a symbol on your zoning map that um it's like a, a symbol that oh here it is this cl you see this cl That just means that the zoning district boundary is supposed to be in the center of your block. But sometimes, you know, you have to figure out what the dimensions of your block are in the first place before you can determine where that center line is. So that's a a common mistake is just not getting the zoning map right off the bat. You know, Um, I think another really common um, problem that people encounter is um, there's a regulation called minimum distance between buildings on a zoning lot. And, um, you know, as zoning lot mergers and transfers, transfers of air rights have become more and more common, 
Um, you've got these zoning lots where it, your zoning lot isn't just your tax lot. It's not just one person owning a zoning lot. You've got a zoning lot that includes multiple tax lots. Maybe this whole block could be a single merged into a single zoning lot. And then you've got multiple buildings on a zoning lot. And there is a rule that says, you know, depending on whether you've got windows facing uh, you know, on the two buildings facing each other, you've got to have like 60 to 80 feet between your buildings. And people forget that. People don't always think about um, the fact that you're on a merged zoning lot and that you can't just build whatever. You have to ha- It has to be a certain distance from what else is already existing. Um, so that's, that's something I've seen people miss. Um, yeah. Thank you. I know, um, mm-hmm. Solly Currency had a question as well. Mm-hmm. Solly. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I'll go, I'll go here. So I had a few questions, but one of them was mm-hmm. like, how much would a person have to pay if they go over a certain limit? Hmm. Like building wise, you mean if you built a building taller than you were allowed to? Yes, you wouldn't pay anything. You would have to just take it down. Okay, well, all right. And, uh, I mean, also, you know, you, you might also get penalties. So yeah, you'd probably have like thousands of dollars in penalties, but you would what? you wouldn't get to keep it. You'd have to take it down. Okay. And uh, what are some factors that raise value in certain zones? Factors that raise value? Um, I think the most, um, in, you mean like the value of property, like what makes property more valuable in certain dis- zoning districts than other zoning districts? Yes, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I would say it's it's like, it's all about density. Like how much floor area are you allowed and how much height are you able to, to, I mean, really floor is the biggest one. Um, like, you know, some of the most valuable real estate in the city is in the densest areas of Manhattan. Um, you know, because let's see, because you're allowed to build the biggest buildings, um, and it just creates more value for, you know, whoever owns it. Um, it's just, it's all about like how much space, um, you know, I, I guess that's not the only thing, you know, being in a central location where, you know, there's all these forms of public transportation that converge on Manhattan. Um, you know, it's easy to get to from New Jersey. It's easy to get to from Brooklyn and Queens that creates value as well. Um, but from my perspective as a zoning lawyer, I think about floor area. Um, so you know, if you compare like the core of Manhattan to like you go all the way out to like outer Queens, you know, which is not to say that outer Queens is not valuable. All of New York City is very, very uh, expensive. But I would imagine, you know, that like, you know, out in this district where you're only allowed to build, um, you know, a one family house, while still probably pretty expensive compared to the rest of the United States, um, compared to Manhattan, it's, uh, much less. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gilbert Bueno has a question. Gilbert? Uh, hi. Um, uh, I was wondering, what is the zoning like for a building that holds historical, historical significance that is also yeah. in a residential area? That's a good question. Um, it is the the zoning resolution doesn't deal with historic significance, but there's another agency of the city that deals with that, and that is the Landmarks Preservation Commission. So let's see if we sort of zoom in here and we toggle the Landmarks button. This is going to show us these two um, buttons are going to show you your historic districts and your landmarks. So. Right. Even in Midtown. Oh, this is Grand Central. Definitely landmarked. Um, See if it'll give us information about it. Um, The Landmarks Commission does designate certain building. Well, that's a lot in Midtown that are designated as landmarks. 
Um, it designates certain buildings as landmarks. And once it does that, you can't tear it down. It has to be not only maintained, but you have to, um, and you have to keep it in good condition. Um, and if you want to change anything about your building, even on the inside, you have to go to landmarks and get them to say it's okay. So sometimes, you know, if you own a historic building, people who own historic buildings, they, I, they just understand that you're, you're never going to be able to change anything about it. Um, sometimes you can, you know, you can obviously like replace windows, you can perform maintenance, but the landmarks commission is going to have a, a very strong say in what kind of materials you use. Like if you need to repaint your building or if you need to repoint the brick or if you need to change out your windows, they're going to say you have to have a window exactly like the historic window that you had originally. Um, so it's not a zoning issue, but it is definitely a land use issue um, about how landmarks are treated. So, yeah. Thank you. That was very helpful. Mm-hmm.